History is also the account of the living vitality of things. Not only where they came from, but what they are. Not merely uh, their historical relationship in time, but their historical relationship to themselves and to the whole structure of life as it is unfolding through man. One of the uh, earliest of the printed histories of the world was the Nuremberg Chronicle, which was published by Kohlberger in Nuremberg about 1490. It was the great picture book of the Middle Ages. It contained over a thousand curious woodcuts and was a wonderful example of early topography. This was a typical history of its time. For naturally, it began the story of history with the opening chapter of Genesis. At that time, history was religious. When you wanted to know what had happened in the past, you merely turned to the Bible. From the Bible, you learned of the wanderings of Israel in the wilderness. You learned of the light of Moses and the prophets. You went back behind this to the story of Jacob and further on, perhaps, to the Garden of Eden and the creation of man. This was history. There was no other approach to history. And the link between history as scripture and history as the record of event was made by bridging across through the latter part of the Roman Empire, so that perhaps Constantine or Justinian began to stand out as an historical personality. Whereas prior to this period, everything was merely a digest of scripture, with perhaps an occasional interlude from the Antonicene Fathers. This type of history tells us something. It tells us that in the days of the Nuremberg Chronicle, Anthropology, as we know it now, did not exist. The wonderful Rosetta Stone, which was to be the key to the glyphs of Egypt, had not been found. And our knowledge of that country was largely through Greek and Roman authors who were late and could give very little understanding of the true magnitude of the Egyptian culture. The Minoan culture was unknown to the editors of the Nuremberg Chronicle. They had no concept of the glacial period or the Paleozoic age. They had no idea of astronomy in terms of space as we know it. And to them, history was a mere continuance of the type of chronology which we found in the sacred writings of the early Jews. It is evident that from such a perspective, a very little philosophy of history could be built. There was no adequate knowledge of the beginnings of our way of life. There was no real consideration for those forces which moved man from a primitive to a savage, from a savage to a barbaric, and from a barbaric to a civilized state. These terms may still be relative, but in those days such relationships and relativities were not even considered. There was no idea of evolution. There was no real effort to indicate any basic relationship between the deeds of one century and the conditions of the next. As late as the time of the great Medici's and Borgias of Florence, human thinking had not devised the idea that the future of the world was in any way dependent upon the conduct of persons then alive. Nor was there any concept that the conditions in which the Florentine lived had any valid relationship to any condition existing before him. There was no philosophy of history, in other words. There was no use of historical evidence as a means of integrating a concept of life. 
the moral force of history was comparatively unknown. In the 19th century, one of the most astute political historians, Karl Marx, began to develop his idea that history is the account of economic conditions upon the unfoldment of peoples. He certainly hit a fragment of a fact. But he was able to build a very strong story to support the idea that what we term progress is dependent upon the security of the individual economically. Aristotle had already suggested this, but Marx carried it much further. So far, indeed, that with him, again, history became distorted out of its natural perspective. All other circumstances were neglected in an effort to show that only by the attainment of economic stability uh, could the advancement of civilization, historically speaking, be assured. History, therefore, becomes involved in many different subjects. Dictionaries are really books of history. For history has to do with the manufacturing of things, the origin of our present commodities and conveniences. History has to do with the growth of a corporation or the rise of a great business house. History also has to do with the continuing effect of enlarging science upon the experience of the individual. So whichever way you turn, history is involved in practically all forms of learning. And all forms of learning in some way are involved in the development of the concept of historic descent. So we may say that history has as its essential purpose two things. First is to record accurately completely and factually the story of man and the world. And the second part of history is to record with equal accuracy the account of the inner condition of man and of other creatures and of, un of institutions at all periods of their physical descent in the world. History, therefore, has to do with health. It has to do with the comforts and inconveniences which human beings experience. History has to do with the growth of moral life in the person during his own lifetime. Every person lives in history. And in every person, also, history itself is alive. The modern tendency is to think of living history, to no longer depend upon recordings out of the past, but to come into direct personal experience with the historic facts of other times. This has sent countless expeditions into the field, and all over the world men are examining firsthand the ruins of ancient cities, uh, the artifacts of old peoples. They are working with the lost symbolic languages of the ancients. They are attempting to restore the cultural platforms upon which these peoples existed. Now this might seem to be a very interesting but essentially unprofitable procedure. The historian may be regarded in this sense as a kind of hobbyist, a person who finds for some reason within himself an all-ensouling project in sifting the ashes of antiquity. But again, a discovery such as the Dead Sea Scrolls points out the continuing vitality of history, that history in some way locks within its own antiquity a great deal of information that we need to know now. Most of all, it is the record of how we got here.
how we have reached our present place. Its psychological import lies in its effort to understand how history has made us what we are, and how in turn the continuance of these trends will continue to perpetuate a similitude of what we are at present. Also, therefore, history takes into account the extraordinary events by means of which suddenly the entire direction of human effort may be altered, its perspective vitally and suddenly changed, and history deals, therefore, with the discoveries of exploration. It recognizes the tremendous psychic shock resulting from the discovery of the Western Hemisphere. It points out, and the future will more clearly indicate, the tremendous change in the directions and motions of history resulting from the development of nuclear fission. We must then consider history to be the continuing record of the results of certain conditions upon the life of man and the projection of these results into the continually unfolding future of mankind. History can be very truthful, but a great deal of history has been a lie from the beginning. And uh, one of the reasons for the dishonesty of history is not essentially that men mean to be dishonest. The trouble has been that the facts of history have not been sufficiently available. And that which cannot be known with certainty becomes the basis of fantasy and imagination. Histories are usually written in certain perspectives, and therefore we become profoundly concerned over the period in which a history of any subject is written. It is evident that a history of the world written in the time of Leonardo da Vinci would be very different from a history of the world written today. This does not mean that this difference would rise entirely from the increased present knowledge. It would rise from a different social complex of circumstances. Interpretations of history, and such historical books are, can therefore not be divided from the time and place in which they are written or compiled. And a history book without a date, a date of publication, is completely meaningless. It is absolutely necessary to evaluate the opinions of man upon any subject with the time in which he holds that opinion. For well, these opinions themselves will change. And that which is historically consistent in one generation will not be in another. Thus today, in the preparation of history, we are not only writing from our facts, but from our biases. And as time goes on, others will revise and reform our findings. Because the completely honest history by the completely honest historian has yet to be written, and they may well not be written for a very long time, if at all. It follows that any moral implication or inference or lesson derived from history cannot be more accurate than the history itself. Therefore, if a history is written from prejudice, its usefulness is largely reduced. If it is written from fanaticism, its usefulness is not only impaired, but it may be totally transformed into a dangerous instrument. Histories, as has been said, are written by conquerors at the expense of the conquered. The conquered has always been wrong. The conqueror has always been right. 
Any such type of history must obviously be highly prejudiced. And if we use such history in the effort to enlarge our own knowledge, we will come to the end, in the end only to prejudice ourselves, even though our tension, intentions may be entirely honorable. So our problem now is to try uh, to understand something of what might be termed living history. History in terms of essential fact. And in the effort to achieve such history, we must become, as far as possible, factual ourselves. One of the duties of the thoughtful person is to consider very definitely the validity of history in terms of that which is known. And it is often necessary for us to pause in our own thinking to determine whether we are building conclusions upon facts or merely upon opinions or prejudices, rumors, legends, fables, or myths. All of these can be involved. It is not only in Western history, but in history throughout the world, uh, that the original background of historical tradition was essentially religious. The scriptural writings of people seem to carry the greatest authority, and scripture therefore to a measure imp impeded the entire progress of history. Men assuming that these sacred writings were inspired, and therefore possessed the full and total substance of that which needed to be known, made no effort or little effort to go beyond these scriptural contents. It was only with the rise of philosophy and its gradual individuality, uh, with some but not complete dependence upon religion, that the philosopher began to, da began to dare to look over the wall of religious history to try to understand what was on the other side of that wall or beyond the scope of it. He came little by little to understand the relationships of values. And in some instances, at a comparatively early time, he came to valid conclusions which are not even generally held today. He came to know, for example, the relationship between the Old Testament and the Babylonian Chaldean culture. He suddenly realized the correct place of the Old Testament in the history of human culture. This discovery forced him to the gradual recognition that the Old Testament was a step or a stage in the unfoldment of a larger picture. Until he was able to have a certain measure of free thought, such conclusions were impossible. But without the proper relationship, for example, between the books of Moses and the Chaldean culture which preceded the culture of the Israelites, we have lost an important link in history. We have a distorted picture of something. The general tendency of religion was always to distort pictures relating to origins. Each religion believed that civilization and culture arose in its own area. It had the tendency to assume that its own ways were right and the ways of other people were wrong. It spent all of its effort in analyzing the estate and destiny of the true believer and ignored or liberally condemned the non-believer. Thus history lost all meaning as a result of extreme bigotry. And this bigotry uh, made it almost impossible for man to benefit uh, from the general descent of knowledge. This knowledge had to be divided into what he could accept and what he could not accept.
and his rejections were more numerous than his acceptances. This type of barrier is largely gone, but there are still many fundamentalists in religion, not only in Christianity but in other religions, to whom their sacred writings are still the primary historical books. And as a result of that, these people are held in a certain attitude which they could not hold with a good grace if they were able to see the larger pattern of unfolding conditions. History is an experience, not only at the time it occurs, but in later time. Unless the individual can experience history, it is meaningless to him as a vital factor in his own personal integration. To a large measure, the subconscious life of man belongs to those remote regions which might be termed past history. The individual has the past history of his own conduct. He has the past history of his own thoughts and emotions locked within himself. Uh, these historical records are as real and significant to him as his family records, as the genealogical reports which he may regard with uh, deep veneration, or even the great anthropological and sociological descent of his kind. Thus history, it seems to me, uh, in order to be valuable, in order to be meaningful to us, has to in some way be vitalized. History has to be a bridging of life so that the individual meets living beings and not merely shadows concealed behind words and inscriptions. It is true that physical history began very largely with carvings upon rock. And as one historian pointed out, Important historical events were not determined by the merit of the occurrence, but by the endurance of the medium in which the record was placed. Thus a record carved into rock would survive a record carved into wood. But the uh, record carved in wood might be the greater of the two and not survive. Thus the lack of consistent media for the preservation of recording resulted in a very unbalanced survival of ancient reports, inscriptions, and the like. This in turn meant that there was no way of being sure in our own consciousness that those things most worthy of recording were most permanently recorded. Nor were we able to estimate the effect of vandalism and natural destruction upon these records. Out of the past, therefore, comes a fragmentary, incomplete, disordered report of things of old time. And we have to put this together with whatever skill we possess in an effort to restore the background of our own world. Why should we bother to do it? We have to do it for one reason, namely that sometime all of this information will have to be fitted together, for out of it will, become, will come historical morality. Out of it will come the gradual recognition of the immutable processes moving through nature. History must ultimately reveal to us the reason for our own existence must ultimately explain to us the circumstances which brought us through centuries of insecurity to our present state, and history must also be a certain, to a certain measure, be the record of the direct consequences of conduct upon circumstance. All these elements we need to know, because man must sometime be convinced that his way of life not only is determined by ancient circumstances, 
but to a large measure determines future circumstances and all that may reasonably be expected from man. Buddha took the position that at some remote time man made a mistake. This is the understatement of the ages, because man has been making mistakes for a long time, and history is in a measure the report of the most exquisite and devastating of these mistakes. But there is one point that we do learn from history, and that is that the original decisions which were most to influence the course of man's destiny were made when man was, le was least capable of decision. Sometime long ago, when man knew much less than he knows now, was less skillful than he is now, uh, was less resourceful than he is now, and had very much less history to view as a moral force in his thinking, back some time when perhaps man resembled the missing link, or had the gently sloping brow of the piltdown man, or his arms were still swinging on the ground alongside of him when he stood erect. At this time, man decided his own destiny. At that time, man started a series of attitudes. He began by having them, and it ended with them having him. It is very much as though we took a child, two or three years old, isolated it from general counsel, and said to that child, decide at this time what you are going to be when you grow up. Well, the child will come to some kind of a decision, or perhaps we can follow the Chinese habit which has sometimes been called the Chinaman's Choice. Uh, this consists of putting a number of articles on the ground in front of a baby and letting the child romp around until it picks one up. This determines its profession. Perhaps that is as good a way as any other. Certainly, at this very early time, man began a way of life. There is no indication that he ever paused once he started and gave a lot of thought to where he was going. He did not. Having started something, he set in motion causes that produced effects that continued to press him relentlessly forward along the line of his original choice. Thus, while he was still very, very young in worldly affairs, he began to develop the incipient tendencies to what we term materialism. Now, why shouldn't he? He was living in a world with saber-toothed tigers and cave bears. He was living in a hollow place in the side of a hill. He had not yet developed fire, and his only weapon was a rock. It was under these conditions that he began to estimate the universe in which he lived. And way back at the beginning of his thinking, we find that he decided that he was living in a very hazardous environment, uh, that the circumstances around him were mostly unfavorable, and that therefore he had to defend his survival first, and that the continuity of his own existence must always be his primary consideration. Thus he got his first exquisite lesson in selfishness, and having been trained in this all through the early archaeological periods, he has descended to the present time without any major change in this perspective. Little by little he built primitive society. This primitive society has unfolded and enriched and become complicated, but it has never essentially changed. The great metropolitan city of today is simply the vast outgrowth of a group of huts in the jungle. There's been no change in policy. There has been no change in policy concerning many things. Education has not made an important uh, 
a break with tradition in 10,000 years. Certainly it teaches more. Educators believe they teach better. Educators feel that the process of educating is an eternal process, that the means now in general use are the best possible means, and uh, conditions will go on. But actually, the whole pattern is archaic, belonging to a time when man was forced to receive instruction, at first at the knee of his parent, and secondly from the old and the wise members of his tribe. There's been no essential change. Little by little, the various beliefs that we had unfolded into the religions which were to come and dominate the world. The first folk convictions became philosophy. The first folk crafts became the arts. Nothing essentially changed. And the long story of man is the story of the projection of an archaic policy, a policy which could become more and more polished and more and more complicated and subtle, but was not methodically renovated as it should have been at various periods in the descent of human experience. Thus experience also came to support tradition, to support the policies already accepted. The individual who broke with tradition broke with society and was penalized. Uh, conformity became the secret of, of survival. And little by little, the instinct to individuality in man was shadowed over by the immediate demand of conformity for survival. This has come in the last hundred years to an absolute regimentation in practically every field of endeavor. And as 5,000 years ago, the individual was sent into the wilderness to die, so today the individual is penalized. And if he hasn't reached the retirement age, we'll have no chance of social security. There is just simply no reward for the individual. Thus, we see why a man like Karl Marx, developing his concept of history, was convinced that the force which most modified uh, the career of man was the power of his economic environment and the pressure of the policy under which he lived, which could demand of him obedience, co cooperation, and acceptance. Therefore, to Marx, the great problem was to bring sufficient economic security to the individual that he could be himself without fear of consequence. But instead of achieving this end, uh, the idea of socialized security led to further conformity, for the only pattern of security that seemed to be possible was the absolute identification of man with a program of industrial development. So little by little, the individuality was again defeated in himself. As we go further and further into history, it will be much as it will be as we go further and further into space, because history is a, also a space dimension. Just as we send satellites out to explore space, so we send various expeditionary forces out today uh, to explore the mysterious area which we call history. We are trying to discover, if we can, the essential fact of man. We want to know where he came from and how he got here. And there seems no other possible way by which we can determine why he is here and where he is going. Man appears to be in history, 
Man appears to be moving through divisions of time, which perhaps he has created himself, but he is also moving through conditions of his own existence and the need to have a thoroughly scientific uh, pattern of these conditions and how man moves through them. This need is generally felt today. Living history, then, is the effort to restore the vital facts of human experience under the various conditions which we relate to other times and places. We can ask a question such as this. Did man a thousand years ago feel differently? Did he use any different structure of faculties than the man of today? When the man of today is quiet and experiences himself as much as he can, is he having the same experience that a Pythagorean may have had 2,500 centuries ago when he sat in meditation? When the individual calls upon his own inner resources today, are these resources identical with those of the man who lived 5,000 years ago? Did the ancient Egyptian think differently? Did he feel differently? Did he react uh, differently to the uh, stress or strain of psychic pressure within his own nature? Was he a, as complicated as we are? Were these differences due to a less involved culture? Were these circumstances the result of the effect of the world upon him, or were they the result of the effect that he created and imposed upon the world? In other words, did Egypt make the Egyptian, or did the Egyptian make Egypt? That is a question which is not easy to answer, yet it's a very intriguing one. Was the Egyptian civilization the result of a people, or was it a series of fortuitous circumstances which a people had to endure? If the Egyptian civilization arose from a preceding one, and was merely the long extension of a more primitive culture, to what degree did the Egyptian himself uh, recreate this culture, or was he recreated by it? Here is an alchemy which is very, very difficult to understand. Let us say, for example, that at some time, 5,000 years ago, an Egyptian built a temple. After he had built the temple, he worshipped in it, and his children after him. And out of this temple came gradually the great traditions which controlled his life. Did these tr traditions arise from the man who built the temple? What was the part that he played in the later modification of the entire culture to which he belonged? Was this temple something that he built from a previous model in an older culture? Was this temple a building which he dreamed or imagined in his own soul? How did this building come into being? And how did man develop the concepts with which this building was associated? Now, this is an interesting thing because it brings us into another form of history, the history of architecture. Architecture obviously develops slowly and methodically from the most primitive structures that man erected. There is no doubt in the world that the magnificent domed building of today is the long shadow of a mud-ceilinged wooden or clay hut. <laughs> 
that many of the great temples and structures that we see with their great columns and facades are nothing but the long shadows of buildings supported by saplings or by trees, and sometimes the trees not even killed, but merely the buildings leaned upon them by ancient craftsmen. Studying the architecture of primitive people, for example, we find there is folk architecture as well as folk art. The southern Korean farmer never had a lesson in architecture. Probably there was not a formal architect within a thousand miles of him in any direction. When he wanted to build, he built, and he made it up as he went along. He found a piece of ground, perhaps his neighbors came in and helped him. He used the materials that he had. Perhaps he took a stick and made a little tracing on the sand or dirt of the general shape he wanted his house to be. Perhaps he didn't even bother with that. Perhaps he only counted the noses of his relatives and made a house that they could all get into. But what happened? When this crude farmhouse was finished, built, and completed, and after maybe 50 generations of Korean farmers had patched it up, put new roofs on it, hung new rooms on the end, a modern architect goes over there, takes photographs of this structure, and announces with bated breath, Magnificent. <laughs> and he will promptly come home, and after he's had 25 years of specialized training, he will do his best to copy that Korean farmhouse and he'll never make it. There'll always be something wrong with his copy, and he will never be satisfied with it himself. What happened? How did this Korean know exactly where to put everything? If you ask him, he doesn't know. If you ask the modern Korean building a similar mud house, he will tell you he doesn't know. In his mind, perhaps he will be copying from some that he remembered long ago. But this design, this pattern, this way of doing things, uh, arises within the consciousness of the individual in some mysterious way. So the historian says, there's one way of looking at it, namely that history is nothing more or less than the story of the rise of consciousness. Beneath every other consideration, it is simply the inside of man breaking through. Now, this breaking through, of course, is not equal, it is not spontaneous in all areas, simultaneously, for the breaking through depends very much upon the kind of world in which that person lives. The breakthrough among tropical people will be different from the breakthrough of those who live in frigid zones. In some way, climate, environment, proximity to mountains and water, all of these will affect the breakthrough. But man is apparently using his consciousness as a means of expressing an instinct within himself to create something that he needs, something that he must have. Now, in his early days, there's no doubt that history was the story of man doing the things he had to do. How he happened to do them, why he happened to do them, we cannot with certainty know as yet, but we believe that he was spurred on by the tremendous power of necessity. He made certain primitive weapons because he had to have them. He found various ways of trapping game because he had to eat. He found various ways of covering and protecting his body because otherwise he could not live. So nearly all of his primitive efforts were highly factual. They were the pressure of absolute necessity. And as this continued on, man's mental life remained comparatively undeveloped. Different areas of the world, however, delivered to man different degrees of pressure. 
If he was living in the South Sea Islands, there was very little pressure. If he was living uh, in some highly mountainous region where land was difficult and storms were frequent, the pressure was very great. So to different degrees, this pressure influenced the rise of his cultures. Now we know, if we look around us, that the people of the South Sea Islands, with very little necessity, and living almost constantly in the presence of everything that they needed, did not develop any very great culture. They developed a very simple way of life. Perhaps they had a greater culture than we know. But it was a culture of utter simplicity, which was sufficient to their needs and might well result in their survival after the rest of us are gone. But they did not make any great contribution to the movements of society. Those also in a very frigid area, like the Eskimos, became more or less the victims of their world, and the problem, the problem of survival left them little time or energy for any other undertaking. So what we know as culture developed in temperate regions uh, where these pressures were not so great. Culture also developed most intensively on vast land areas. You find very few great cultures originating in small insular regions. The great cultures, therefore, began in Asia, a vast empire, a vast area of land, America, and uh, Africa. These were the great land regions. From these areas the culture spread, sometimes dying in their own lands and surviving among other peoples. But because of certain advantages, even in these other and different continents, the tendency of civilization was to rise in the most temperate regions, and for some reason not entirely clear, but undoubtedly quite meaningful, in the Northern Hemisphere. This probably has to do with magnetic currents in the Earth, and with the general development of climatic factors, perhaps magnetic fields, or the varying degrees of solar influence. In any event, the Northern Hemisphere seems to have produced in its temperate zones the great cultural systems that we know. Now these pressures of environment upon consciousness moving into manifestation seemed also to tell us that man needed challenge, that he needed certain requirements and necessities, he had to develop certain strength of character. And in those areas where the struggle was intense but not overwhelming, where you had to work hard to win, but you could win if you worked hard, in those areas we begin to find progress taking various shapes. If there was no chance of winning, progress vanished. If there was no chance of losing, progress vanished. There had to be a certain constant stimulation to effort. As man went on gradually in his way of life, he slowly discovered the possibility of life by mutual assistance. He began to realize that it wasn't necessary for every member of the tribe to raise his own corn, that it wasn't necessary for every member of the tribe to build his own house that by degrees, through various cooperative procedures, men could specialize according to their skills or inclinations, perhaps originally according to their physical resources, and by various achievements, uh, advance the common group, and by barter, exchange what they produced for what they needed. As production became more and more organized, the element of leisure was introduced into human experience. 
man having gained a certain primary threshold or platform of cultural advance, suddenly discovered that he had time to sit down and think. This was when he began to grow, and this was also when he began to get into trouble. The individual beginning to develop a mental life naturally and immediately began to speculate, speculate, speculate about himself, about the circumstances that created him, about the causes of the world in which he lived, about the good or ill of the pressures around him. And out of this first immature, undisciplined instinct to speculation came fantasy and self-delusion. Little by little, man built an imaginary world, a world of attitudes and opinions, a world of traditions and beliefs. And these, little by little, became more factual than facts, until in the end, unfolding man became completely locked in a world of opinions, a world in which nature's actual facts were for the most part ignored. These opinions became more important to man as man's naturally developing skill enabled him to make certain victories over the circumstances around him. Mistaking skill for true erudition, the individual believed that if he could outwit his enemy in something, then he was right in everything. History shows us this gradual motion and shows us how step by step man moved from a universe of facts in which he had to live to a universe of ideas. And that this and in this universe of ideas he developed the strong pressures of opinion which led later to tyranny, oppression, and practically ever every corruption of mankind. In the course, therefore, of history Man lost track of the unfoldment of universal law around him and within him, Cl began to cling to a doctrine of coincidence and accidents, lost sight almost willingly of the relationships of what he was to what he had been. He did not wish to face these things because they became impediments to the continuance of what he called free will. To man, freedom was always important. And therefore, from the earliest periods of history, freedom was a privilege bestowed by the state. Freedom was reserved for a small minority of persons and their superiority was measured by the fact of this freedom which they enjoyed. Thus instinctively man always regarded the state of freedom as superior. Now freedom for the average person, as exemplified in the free man of antiquity, was the right of one person to keep slaves. The free man might choose to keep slaves, and the free man was the master of those men who were not free, and the free man had the power of life and death over those who were not free. Consequently, freedom, instead of becoming the privilege to grow, became the privilege to possess to dominate and to control. Somewhere along the line this trend should have been changed, but it never was. And even as we think of political liberty and freedom of life as we know it today, we instinctively fall back upon the old concept that freedom is the right of the individual to impose himself upon someone else. Freedom is not the right uh, to be just free yourself. Freedom is the right that you possess to influence other people, but you are protected from their influence by your own definition of freedom. So freedom is still what it was before. 
the right of the individual to do what he wants to do. And this desire to want to do something nearly always means that what we want to do will cost someone else some part of their own freedom. This we have always held to be our idea of liberty. Freedom, consequently, is not freedom to grow. It is freedom to control, to dominate, or to take over. Freedom today means the right to do anything we want to do. And uh, gradually, ethics disintegrates under the pressure of so broad and meaningless a definition. The next point that comes out of our historical survey, then, perhaps is almost Zen-like in its implication. And that is that history is something uh, that has an immediacy in it. By some method, by some means within ourselves, we must move all history into the state of now. Actually, now is the only time any of us can experience history. The Greeks have been gone a long time, the Romans have been gone almost as long, and the Egyptians longer. We cannot actually dig up their time. We can excavate the ground, we can rifle their tombs and rob their monuments. But the only Egypt that can have any effect upon us is the mental image of Egypt in ourselves. We can read a dozen books on Egypt and we can clarify a kind of inner Egypt in ourselves. We can see the old temples and the pyramids. We can see the great avenues of sphinxes and obelisks. We can sense something of the distant, romantic, glamorous, uh, artistry of that time, we can conveniently forget any part of it that we do not want to remember, and out of it all comes not the Egypt of 5,000 years ago, but a motion picture kind of Egypt, something that has no existence but shadow, yet shadow which we seem to be able to make alive. So all the past, all history, has no ex existence, actually, except our own internal reaction to certain so-called historical stimuli. We can never be the past, and the person we are today can never be the future. The only thing that man can be at any given moment is himself at that moment. Yet at that moment in which he is himself, now, this instant, he has great pressure and problem. He has many needs and many personal experiences. So the question is, what does history mean to the individual at any given moment? In what way do we transform the history concept and reunite it with the news concept, which is the matter of the immediate occurring circumstance. Well, the immediate occurring circumstance involved in history is our discovery of it, our experience of it, our revitalizing of it in ourselves. In a few moments, perhaps in five minutes, man can inwardly experience a descent of history that took 10,000 years. He cannot experience every detail. But the broad picture of what we do know about history, if we are acquainted with these facts, can be revived almost immediately in our consciousness. So man has the psychological pressure of history within himself. And now he has one thing he must do, must always do, and that is realize that this history is merely one way in which his own entity reflects itself from the world around man. Uh, each person who reads the same history book and contemplates it will have a different historical experience, because he will have the experience from within himself. 
If he is an artist, he will have a tremendous ex uh, elation as he relives the artistry of Greece and Rome. If he is a great architect, he will probably fasten his attention immediately upon the vast monuments of Nubia, which are among the architectural monuments of the world that are of first importance. If he is a man of letters, he will remember the great literatures of history, the great inscriptions and the tablets and the cuneiform, in which the first thoughts and poems and histories and laws of men were inscribed. Each, according to his own interest, will find in history something that warms him or uh, awakens in him a certain nostalgia, the nostalgia of historic association. But this does, again, not serve him too well right now. He can enjoy these nostalgias, and still the world he lives in can fall apart around him. So there has to be something more important in this, or our project is meaningless. In the consciousness and constitution of man, he possesses himself a faculty which is akin to history, a faculty by means of which history is possible as an experience in his own consciousness, or the feeling that he is in some way the victim of his own past or that there lurks in the past things by which the present is disabled, and he will not be unable to live a full and rich experience. So history in man is this nagging of his own mistakes in the background, his inability to divide himself also from his attitudes. And we find all of this in history. National histories have for thousands of years perpetuated national feuds, and led to the continuance of national wars. National traditions have prevented people from finding friendships and a mutual understanding. Traditions, memories in the form of religion have divided the world into six religious bodies that are as yet unable to find common ground. Memory in politics has divided the world into systems of government and states. All of these memories and the desperate effort to perpetuate patriotically the fragment at the expense of the total picture, all this together have made memory a very sad and uh, difficult thing to work with. Yet memory is important. Memory and history are equally important. And the use of one wisely gives us a key to the use of the other wisely. The proof of our ability to use history rather than to be abused by history lies in our own power of insight and in the ability of the individual in a Zen-like way to handle facts factually. Always it is the distortion. Always it is the exaggeration that gets us into trouble. It is not the, the actual content of history that destroys us. It is the expansion of this content and its intensification by emotion that leads almost certainly uh, to the perpetuation of decadent and comparatively worthless institutions. So in our daily thinking, we deal with history and memory in the same way. We begin by the very simple effort to understand that today, now, at this moment, each one of us is a unique creature. In this uniqueness, we have never lived before, because we have never lived this moment before. We will never live again because we will never live this moment again. A minute from now, another self will live again a unique experience in another moment. But at any given time, the only fact, the only reality is now. Against this now, we have memory history pressure. 
Now, memory and history are both useful only in terms that they are available in the conduct of now. Now we must make decisions. Now we must come to conclusions. Now we must adjust ourselves. Now we must find security and peace of mind. Therefore, all the ages and all time and all condition, all these move in upon us to provide us either with the material for the successful now or else for the unsuccessful now. To use this information, we must then gain this peculiarly factual ability uh, to estimate historical and moral circumstances without the common exaggerations with which we dilute uh, our findings in these areas. What is history, if we think about it? History is just the record of things done well and things done badly and, to a measure, the causes of both things done well and things done badly. History, therefore, becomes actually the world's most powerful statement of the consequences of action, that every action arises in a cause that every cause unfolds inevitably into an effect. And history is the unfolding of the total cause into the total effect as far as man is concerned. Man's own memories are the history of the unfoldment of his causes and their effects. And history for man in memory points out clearly and definitely the inevitable relationship between previous conduct and present condition. If history had meant this from the beginning, we would have had the most powerful ethical system conceivable, because it would have been an ethics founded in the development and function of universal law. But we did not get this experience. We were never able to realize that the actual story of history is simply the story of cause and effect. That history is the unfolding of ways of action. And that in every period of history, innumerable ways of action have unfolded simultaneously. And in every period of human cultural growth, human beings of different temperaments, different attitudes, and different opinions have been living together, growing together, and making difficult each other's existence in this name of individuality. So in when we stop now and say to ourselves, what does the past mean? It means only what our own degree of penetration is able to bestow upon it. If it suddenly becomes to us the perfect proof and evidence of the operation of universal law, then history becomes immediately useful to us. For that which we fully appreciate, grasp, understand, and accept, we inevitably practice. The reason why we preach much and practice little is because we have never had the vital internal experience of recognizing the importance of the values that we preach. If we really experience them, we would live them. If we only think about them, we only talk about them. Experience in history represents the unfoldment of a certain degree of insight. This insight takes from history all its bitterness, takes from history all its unfairness, takes from history all of the records of wars, 
and plunder with which we have long burdened history, and reduces it to its essential basic content, and proves to us that man can only live by dying, can only come finally to the preservation of himself through self-destruction, and that he can only uh, come to peace by the exhaustion of his determination to war. His peace, therefore, comes through the experience within himself of the utter futility of things done previously. History is the record of this futility. History theoretically becomes a scripture because it teaches us that uh, there are things that we can never do successfully and things that will never fail if we do them well. In this way, history cuts through any cycle of time. For true history is not necessarily compatible with the state of man at any given time. Thus, for example, the true history of man is not compatible with his conduct now. History should have taught us much that we have not learned. And had man inwardly vitalized history as an immediate living factor in his own consciousness, we would have outgrown war long ago, because we would have discovered long ago what we must still discover, namely that no one can win a war. We say this, but we have not experienced it or we would have peace. Now we say, of course, that some people have experienced this, but that not enough have experienced it. This is true. But with the facilities at our disposal, and we approach the subject correctly, what we call today the nominally educated world would all have experienced it, or most would have. And those today who are learning almost any subject, from the most advanced professions uh, to the most elementary crafts, would have received this insight as a common part of culture. But they haven't received it. They have never been taught that history meant something to them now. They have been taught that history had to do with Washington and Franklin and Lafayette. They have been taught about the Magna Carta and the Bill of Rights. But they have never realized that history is something that teaches them every day something of the mystery of daily living. Now, while we had a very poor knowledge of history, many of our mistakes were excusable. When we had a very poor knowledge of space, there was reason why a scientist could be an atheist. But as our knowledge of history unfolds, it is just as stupid for us to deny its lawfulness as it is for the uh, advanced physicist or astronomer projecting his consciousness into the concepts of outer space, just as it would be foolish for him to deny that this magnificent fabric is in some way ensouled by an ample consciousness. So greatness of learning bringeth the mind back again to God, as Lord Bacon said in his essay on atheism. And depth of understanding brings man's knowledge of history, back again to the recognition that history is the account of law-keeping and law-breaking, and that in every instance in history the law-breaker has failed, and in every instance in history lawfulness has ultimately won. Now this isn't necessarily true of the efforts of every man, for the reason that many who believed they were lawful were not. And many who believe themselves lawless unintentionally contributed to progress. Therefore, man cannot always identify lawfulness in his own terms. He can only begin to estimate the validity of that which succeeds or survives the great test of time. 
An artist, great in his own day, is well rewarded and greatly applauded by his contemporaries. His paintings sell for large sums of money. He is considered to be the most successful and brilliant of men, and in a hundred years he is totally forgotten, and his paintings are worthless. Another artist dies in a garret of malnutrition. He never sells anything during his lifetime. He is ridiculed and scorned. Five hundred years later, he is discovered as one of the great geniuses of all time. The one who succeeded had something within his art that meant that he had to fail. The man who immediately failed had something in his art that could only be discovered after man himself had grown further than that time. So that in all things, time divides the values of things, conferring its greatest benefits upon those values which are greatest. A man studying these procedures should and co could come almost immediately to the direct experience of that which nature will permit and that which nature will not permit, that which nature will applaud and that which nature will condemn. Also that which nature will build up and that which nature will tear down. And against these factors there are no recourses, and they are the basis of universal morality. The individual who has the clearness of insight to follow nature in all things, to first of all keep faith with the great motions of life, will then find that these motions of life will sustain him in the various incidents and circumstances through which he passes. The political side of the problem is only valuable to the degree that it again indicates what forms of political uh, structure are most enduring. Now, the experience in all fields held by natural law is that ultimately all forms, all structures, all compounds must be dissolved. Man has never yet produced a structure that will be capable of eternal continuance. Man has never produced within himself a degree of intelligence which is not in need of continuous reform. Man has never known so much that he dared to pause for an instant in his search for greater knowledge. A man has not yet so integrated his own nature that he can survive beyond the normal expectancies of physical life. Thus we cannot say that nature has given its perfect accord to anything that we have done. Nature, however, does bestow certain rewards and certain merits. Uh, nature brings harmony and integration to those structures which preserve the purposes which nature intends. Nature also makes things most easy or most clear for those who most completely abide by nature's ways. And out of this comes the still further historical but trans-historical circumstance and fact that man must sometime break the pattern of history and perhaps sink back into the quiet contemplation of nature as the only answer to the complexity of the life which he has developed. We come to the picture of the old Chinese sage sitting in his little cottage by the side of the waterfall, gazing out upon the great expanse of mountains and sky, here in the quietude of an internal existence, rich in meaning. The Chinese sage is making peace with history. He is making peace with the mountains and the forces that brought forth the hills. He is making peace with the oceans and the rivers that feed them. He has suddenly discovered that he is living in a very simple world of immediate facts. 
that these immediate facts call from himself immediate response. And that is, he understands and applies these facts. This immediate response is pleasant, is quiet, is peaceful, is not burdened by any false reports or by any misunderstanding of anything. There is simply a very quiet, immediate rapport between the heart and mind that are open and the wisdom that dwells among and flows from the eternal hills. So man becomes in this strange, mysterious way unhistorical in the midst of history. He becomes unhistorical because he is free from every false pressure which history, tradition, condition can cause upon his own nature. Yet he is in no way open to license. His freedom is a quiet kind of acceptance of nature. He is free because he obeys, not because he disobeys. And the proof of his freedom is his own peace, and not the wild gestures of liberty which he is so inclined to make. His, he is at peace with the law because he is beyond that degree of consciousness in which he will break law. And laws are only terrible for, to those who break them. So this person has an immediate living experience of the living world around him. He has in some mysterious way broken through the sequence patterns of time, which exist in order that he may grow up step by step to self-intelligence. And he has suddenly attained this insight. He is intelligent. He is intelligence. He has made himself one uh, through his own consciousness with this unhistorical universe, uh, which is, so to say, the highest form of historical report. Now, here we have two factors involved. We have nature, which in itself is not historical. Because nature of itself is an eternal process, eternally progressing through space. Man, however, <coughs> at only one stage of his growth, can reach up to the point where he can experience the, the unhistorical eternity of nature. When he achieves that, he has Zen. <coughs> when he has that, he has a certain internal illumination. At that moment, he transcends history. But this power of the unhistorical in man is the result of history. It is a result of gradually building up through a whole cycle of experiences the understanding that transcends experience itself. So I think we can say definitely that history is the story of man unfolding through nature to conscious identification with the essential essence of nature. All history shows this strange kind of progress. It also shows man's continuing struggle against progress. But most of all, it reveals that even man's mistakes move him relentlessly toward the achievement of his own destiny. So history is the proof of that destiny. It is the evidence beyond doubt that there is an inevitable purpose, inevitably moving. And uh, Zen and other systems show to us that this purpose is achieved when man, in a strange way, devours history with a single bite in the same way that it is said that John the Apostle ate the book which the angel handed to him. For man devouring history, assimilating history, taking history into himself as a tremendous force of consciousness, suddenly achieves the unhistorical state. He transcends history. He digests it, he assimilates it, he rises above it. And to a measure, each human being has this experience. 
whether it is the history of his world or the history of his own personal life and that which went before to make up the experience of the years. The moment of transcendence in history or in anything else is the, ma is the moment of the suspension of the dichotomies of polarity. The individual cannot become unhistorical as long as he is held within the bonds of right and wrong, good and evil, life and death, light and darkness, ignorance and wisdom, superstition and insight, hope and despair, faith and fear. These polarities force the individual to remain in that channel of causations by which Buddha uh, shows the symbol in the wheel of the law forever turning. There is no escape from the wheel to the for the individual who clings to that wheel through clinging uh, to false definitions of values arising from a misunderstanding of the entire content of history. How man can have gone through as much history as he has and learned as little as he has is always a great mystery. But he has managed to do it because he has armed himself with such tremendously powerful opinions that even facts cannot break through them. But in this uh, problem of these polarities, the individual binds himself to historical sequence. The moment he has an opinion, that opinion has a consequence, and the motion of that opinion into its consequence is history. Yesterday the man had an opinion, it had its consequences. That was past history. The motion of the present attitude into the future, with its consequence, will be future history. And man, therefore, in past, present, and future, is bound to a, in a chain reaction to a series of attitudes which he himself has put in motion. The individual who hated yesterday will be sick today. The individual who in his sickness becomes grumpy and hates somebody else will be sick again tomorrow. And thus it will go on until the individual discovers that there can be no help with hatred that the individual cannot achieve to any release from sequence unless he breaks the pattern which causes sequence. History is karma in the East Indian philosophy. History is effect following cause forever. In the story of man, it is the same thing. Man, to escape from history, must break the sequences of cause and effect. One of the simplest and most powerful of these sequences is simply memory itself. For out of the memories of yesterday we have sickened today. And because the memory will endure, from the memories of today we will sicken tomorrow. As long as these memories, themselves essentially sick, are perpetuated, they will cause sickness. Wherever there is, therefore, any uh, inadequacy, any inconstancy, any conflict in the human personality, memory as history will perpetuate it and thrust it upon us and continue to do so. We will go on, therefore, suffering from one phase of our remembrance to another until we cease the pattern. Now, of course, everyone will say that memory is something you cannot control, that you can't stop thinking about yesterday. In other words, you can't stop the young man of today from reading history either. It is part of his instruction. But it is perfectly possible to put a new dimension into the understanding of history. The individual can simply take the attitude, for instance, 
that his memory is like a kindly and ancient guardian, that his memory is performing for him the most signal service, that it is wonderful to remember how he has suffered, because this memory makes it possible for him to know why. It is the same with the problem of pain. We none of us like pain. But if we did not have the power to feel pain, we would destroy ourselves early in life, and probably not one in a million would reach maturity. Pain is a warning, which if we observe it, will protect us from a greater evil. Unhappy memories are warnings, which if we will remember them properly, become blessings because they preserve us from greater ills. History is a warning, and all the most unhappy parts of history become magnificently luminous if they impel in us a degree of understanding which causes us not to repeat the mistakes of history. Thus we can live with memory without being unhappy. We can live with it the moment our own consciousness can recognize the friendliness of memory rather than its constant tyranny. We have no trouble remembering the friendliness of memories if they are pleasant. But the problem is to realize that it is the unpleasant memory that is the monument to the unfinished business. And this is what we have to bear in mind. One unhappy memory that helps us to grow is a better memory than fifty pleasant memories that teach us very little. The pleasant memories always inspire us to think how good we are or how much we have already achieved. The unpleasant memory is, first of all, merely something to remind us of the unfairness of life, when actually it is nothing but the record of our own mistake. If, then, we use it properly, we see that memory is the only power that we have that can really teach us, even as history becomes the most magnificent instrument of world progress that we know, but only if we use it and only also if we can move from history as teacher to the unhistorical experience of release from the sequences of cause and effect. Buddhism, of course, takes a very negative point on this, probably because it has never been able to conceive of a positive one, namely that the only answer to not getting into trouble is to stop doing the things that cause trouble. Now, we might say we could also start doing the things that do not cause trouble. But as Hamlet says, aye, there's the rub. We are not able to find very much that we can do that does not cause trouble. We say to ourselves, we're not going to be unhappy today, we're going to have a beautiful day, we're all going out and have a wonderful dinner and be happy. So everybody comes home with indigestion. Or the individual eats too much and gets sick. He never seems to be able to do pleasant things that do not have unpleasant consequences. He decides he'll be nice to everybody, so in a few days he's cheated out of everything he owns. <laughs> so the problem of what to do uh, that is just, right, and proper is more complicated than it appears. Perhaps Buddha is right. The simplest thing is to know what not to do. This, apparently, you can learn. But in order to know what to do, you must assume a greater knowledge of the unknown than most people possess. We have only the 
experience of our mistakes to guide us in action. All the things that make us comfortable are negative. All the things that make us uncomfortable are dynamic or positive because they have a distinct message. Pleasant things do not seem to tell much of anything except their own pleasantness. But unpleasant things have a large message in most cases. The historical escape, then, in, in the terms of Buddhism, is this ability simply uh, to move out of this historical context of always doing something that causes something else that causes something else, and just be perfectly quiet for a moment and relax with the full concept that if we do this, we are now starting a new kind of causation. If we, if we start simply relaxing, about the only harvest can be relaxation. If we start doing nothing, the only harvest can be nothing. There is nothing more. That which we do not do cannot produce consequences. Now, what happens in a universe in which there are no consequences? Well, consequences and their causes and their effects and so forth really have nothing to do with the true world. Uh, that, the true world is a world that is much bigger than these things. The world that is beyond cause and consequence, as far as man's moral experience is concerned, is the world of the sunset and the flowers and the mountains. Probably if he breaks them all down philosophically, he can find causes and consequences everywhere among them too. But his impact of them upon his own consciousness is that the moment he ceases making mistakes, he is one with that which is right. The moment, therefore, that he ceases to be a slave of the past or ceases causing habits for which he will be a slave in the future, in that absolute moment of the transcendence of cause and effect, he is for the only time in his own experience himself. That is the only moment he has command of his own consciousness. The only time he has command of his own consciousness is when he does not command it. He, when the moment he says to his consciousness, I want you to like Smith or I want you to dislike Jones, his experience is gone. But if he does not thus demand of his own inner life that it shall follow his patterns of opinions and purposes and allows it to be itself, it will like that which is likable. It will be for that which is right. It will perceive the truth among those things in which truth can be concealed. It will separate that which is from that which is not of itself, because the confusion only exists due to the activity of man's complicated, complicated psychic organism. The man is free from yesterday and tomorrow only when he is perfectly quiet and living in a consciousness of now that contains within it also the whole area of eternity. History is therefore swallowed up in consciousness. History exists only for man to finally be able to relax totally to history, to recognize that history simply tells him things that he has always needed to know, but he has never really wanted to know. History is only telling him that there is only one way in which he can cause his own total consciousness, and that is by ceasing to cause anything which disrupts it. Man cannot create consciousness. Man is an, a great egotist if he believes that he can educate consciousness. We think of it in a term now, we think that man is spiritually born, perhaps, as a, 
little uh, psychic infant who must be dabbled with by every psychologist in perdition. But actually, man's consciousness created him. And it is audacity for the individual who does not know what consciousness is to try to tell it what to think. Yet we all do it. We say to consciousness, you must like this because I like it. You must not like this because I think it injured me. It was unkind to me, therefore you must hate it. And we slowly build up their way, in that way our tutoring of our own inner life so that it becomes simply a composite image of our own prejudices. If we stop all this, and if we gradually relax the pressures which cause these things, we then realize the problem of the Buddhistic nidanas. The reason why we, we think injurious thoughts is because someone we believe has injured us and we remember. We keep on remembering what has been done to us and blissfully forgetting what we have done to others. We have this peculiar kind of remembrance. But if we can transcend all of this, even for an instant, we find the unhistorical fact in ourselves, and we find the, in, the unhistorical point in history. We find that all history is simply the story of this unfolding of the unhistorical and its final victory over the conditioned states of human experience. If we attain this, according to the old Eastern concept, man has this flash of cosmic consciousness. And this cosmic consciousness cuts through every division and form of history and circumstance. It doesn't tell us just what the Babylonians were thinking, nor does it enable us to restore the lost civilizations of Gondwana land or something of that nature. But this experience suddenly flashes through with the total integrity of the universal purpose. The moment that purpose is positive, history becomes the servant of it. And as a servant becomes an admirable help. But when this inner consciousness is negative, then history becomes positive and tyrannizes upon human consciousness. The same is true of our own memories. Thus, there is great need for a general revival of interest in the recognition of history as a great experience pattern from which an uncertain generation floundering in doubts and vicissitudes could, if it so desires, learn the inevitable outcome of every vice now practiced, the inevitable misery of every policy which has previously been attempted and is now being attempted again. History shows us that the mistake can never win. History shows us that there is no way of pushing a, a vice to the point where it becomes a virtue. History reports to us definitely that war will never lead to peace, that selfishness will never lead to contentment, that greed will never lead to harmony, that hate will never end in love, and that these various negative forces can never produce a world in which man can live safely and serenely. Therefore, that history tells us with the certainty of a revelation from Mount Sinai that the only answer to these types of things is to set causes in motion which will produce the results that we desire, that these causes must be set in motion by quietude, by peace, by honor, by honesty. And they can be determined and defined only when the individual permits consciousness itself to move into manifestation 
and set up its own unhistorical relationship with life. From that time on, history becomes merely the instrument of man's fulfillment, instead of as it is today, a continuous plague upon his life from beginning to end. I think that's about enough for this evening. Now we'll all settle back and be historical.